medical team here at Case Western Reserve. Um, I eat and I teach torts, and I uh, <laughs> do some work on national security as well, and I suppose that's what qualifies me to chair this panel. Um, we, I can speak best from the American perspective, but I suspect that this has crept over the border to Canada as well. Uh, we are a society that seems to be obsessed with food. We have a cable TV network that is dedicated solely to the subject of food. Um, we supersize our meals and then hope that we don't also supersize ourselves. Uh, this past year, uh, one of the hit movies was about a woman who worked her way through uh, Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking. Um, we care about food a lot. But this is also an age of increased anxiety, so we worry about what it is that we eat. Uh, Julia Child used nothing more threatening than butter. Lots and lots and lots of butter. Um, but we worry about other things as well. Uh, most recently we worry, um, thankfully it is a remote, but a real risk that we have to worry about. We worry about uh, bioterrorism and adulteration of the food supply. Um, a generation ago, after the Tylenol tampering scare, it was more a concern about uh, people either bearing a grudge or with uh, extortion uh, in mind, uh, adulterating the food supply. Um, uh, for those of you who uh, read the newspapers from time to time or have read a book like Fast Food Nation, you know that whatever those risks are, the far greater risk that we face every day is from foodborne illnesses, from careless handling, careless processing, uh, lax supervision uh, of uh, the, the food supply. Um, so the problems are very real, the risks are real, uh, and the need to get a handle on, on these risks are also very real. Uh, we are fortunate to have uh, two speakers today who know a great deal about this subject. Um, and I will introduce them both briefly. You have much uh, more detailed biographies. There's no point in my reading them to you because they're in your program. Um, Stephanie LaRiviere is the regulatory manager for both Erie James Limited and Sensation Acres Incorporated. Um, she is also a member of the Food Safety Board Committee of the Ontario Greenhouse Vegetable Growers um, in Leamington, Ontario. Are they in Leamington or you're in Leamington? We all are in Leamington. Everybody is in Leamington. Um, and uh, this is, uh, not to carry the food metaphor too far, uh, but this is actually a second helping uh, because Cindy Totem Cherniak, you may notice, is on the program tomorrow as well. Uh, she is pinch hitting today. Um, she is counsel in the, um, in far too many groups for anybody who wants to have a life uh, to be in. But they include international trade law, environmental energy, emissions trading groups. Uh, and others at Lang Michener's Toronto office. Um, and I will now sit down and let them speak. You left one thing out. Leamington is also the home of the world's largest tomato. The, the world's largest single tomato? Yes, it's made of concrete. <laughs> <laughs> I will pay it a visit. I am. <laughs> And you're quite right at that. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stephanie Larivier. I'm very delighted that I could join you today. Um, I'm here to represent um, the Ontario Greenhouse Vegetable Growers and give you an insider look on food safety in our industry. Uh, we are the tomato capital of Canada, down in Leamington, and we are very 
south, um, we're often called the sun parlor of Canada for our southern location. So I'd like to give you a little bit of background about us. OGBG was formed in 1967 and represents over 227 producer members. We are the leader in Ontario. Ontario is the leader in greenhouse vegetable production with more than 1,824 acres devoted to tomatoes, English cucumbers, and sweet bell peppers. OGBG is involved in a variety of initiatives for its Ontario producers, such as lobbying the government, regulatory efforts, food safety initiatives, research, and the OGBG Marketing Committee puts on trade shows and events which showcase our products. They also address the media, provide demos and educational materials to the consumer, and they collect and track data and trend information for our growers. Little uh, interesting facts about the size of our industry. Ontario holds over 60% of total greenhouse acreage in Canada and over 70% of all Ontario greenhouse produce is exported to the United States. In 2009 alone, we produced over 390 million pounds of tomatoes, over 110 million pounds of peppers, and over 240 million pounds of English cucumbers. You can see our production schedule. Our consumers want fresh quality produce year round. And we are steady through the year with English cucumbers, which are available from January straight through to December. And OGBG is currently working on various initiatives to make a year-round production cycle more feasible for our tomatoes and sweet bell peppers. Greenhouse, greenhouse growing is very unique. It eliminates many of the environmental vulnerabilities that the field crops are subjected to. The greenhouse is a controlled environment. We can adjust its temperature, humidity, food and water, all at the touch of a button. We use a hydroponic growing method. Our integrated pest management allows us to use insects found in nature to keep the good pests in and the bad ones out. Essentially, these good bugs eat the bad bugs and protect the plants from harmful pests. We recycle, reuse and reduce as much as we can to manage costs and be good stewards. Some examples are um, the recycling of our water, we optimize our use of heat, <coughs> and we recapture CO2 before it's emitted into the atmosphere. The CO2 is actually released back into the plants to ensure optimal growth and development. A little bit about how we're regulated. OGBG has authority under Regulation 417 of the Farm Products Marketing Act. OGVG sets regulations for all their producers and marketers of greenhouse vegetables. These regulations cover things like licensing fees, food safety and traceability, pricing and contracting, and dispute resolution in regards to both producing and marketing the greenhouse products. The OGVG Board of Directors reviews, amends, and approves the general regs annually. In Canada, our primary regulatory body authority is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, or the CFIA. The CFIA monitors all imports and exports for food products. The CFIA conducts regulatory on-site visits to marketers and packers to ensure compliance, and they perform inspections and resolve disputes over quality between buyers and sellers. <coughs> They're also responsible for the notification and investigation of food recalls. Their responsibilities are very similar to those under FDA's Food and Drug Administration, and we live so close to the border that many of our Canadian regulatory requirements do parallel those established in the United States. OGVG's food safety program requires that all licensed marketers and packers and growers of Ontario greenhouse produce have a third-party GMP, GAP, or HACCP audit by an accredited certification body at least annually. These audits explore a company's policies, procedures, and controls over their PRPs or prerequisite programs. Now, for those of you that don't know what some of these terms are, I'll try to explain. Prerequisite programs are the conditions that must be established throughout the food chain and the activities and practices that must be performed in order to keep and maintain a hygienic environment. Good manufacturing practices and good agricultural practices are important contributors to the success of any prerequisite program. And solid PRP programs can reduce the likelihood of a risk or a hazard occurring. So they're really the building blocks of a HACCP program. 
We were the first in our industry to require third-party audit certifications as a regulatory requirement. In addition to annual food safety audits, OGBG made traceability systems mandatory as well. All producers must identify themselves um, using their farm's identification code, which is registered on file with the OGBG. We have some close industry relationships. OGBG works in close cooperation with other partners in the industry, such as CHC and OGMA. CHC is a voluntary not-for-profit association uh, which represents the Canadian horticulture. They're responsible for establishing food safety and crisis management for their industry members. OGVG also works in collaboration with the Ontario Greenhouses Marketers Association, and together their goals are to increase awareness of the Ontario greenhouse sector and to increase aggregate demand for all of our greenhouse products. Some challenges that we've faced in the last decade uh, post 9-11. Our products are perishable and move very quickly through the supply chain to the consumer for consumption. Time is of the essence when moving our products from farm to market so that we can deliver quality and freshness that our customers demand. We've been faced with post 9-11 challenges that have impacted our business. U.S. Customs and Border Protection and U.S. Homeland Security introduced the CTPAT Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism program. It's a voluntary program which many of our marketers have elected to join in an effort to strengthen and protect the supply chain from the threat of bioterrorism. Also, the Bioterrorism Act was introduced which requires that anyone exporting food to the U.S. provide an FDA registration number and give prior notice each time a shipment crosses the border into the United States. It requires access to records for all products in question, and trucks can be delayed, stopped, or even demand at the border. Now in an industry where your product is extremely perishable and the market can fall short unexpectedly, this provides us with a logistical nightmare. Ordered quantities can often change at the last minute prior to shipping. Sometimes orders can be unexpectedly cancelled. And more often than not, buyers can call in at the very last minute uh, with orders to replenish their falling inventory levels. Rapid, unpredictable changes in shipping quantities can make prior notice and crossing the border for timely delivery sometimes difficult and um, almost impossible. Um, many revisions to customs documents can take place sometimes two, three, four times in the afternoon uh, prior to loading a truck for crossing the border. The CTPAT program requires detailed security profile questionnaires for all of its members, which outline physical premise security, employee background checks, uh, computer system and security protocols, trailer inspections for cargo, and proof that business partners are financially sound. Verification visits are conducted by U.S. Customs and Border Protection to validate the company's security programs functioning as they've outlined it in their profile. And to remain in good standing, one must demonstrate not only their own compliance, but that also that their suppliers have some knowledge of who their business partners are, and that either CTPAT members themselves, or that they adhere to CTPAT's minimum security requirements. These programs have required us to invest more time in educating our employees and our management personnel to oversee these initiatives. And since it's a voluntary program, the challenge remains in the supply chain as a whole to adopt best security practices to minimize biological threats to our food supply. With the rising increase in foodborne illness and, and food safety recalls, food safety audits are a key step in preventing our products from becoming contaminated as they move from farm to fork. Annual third-party audit certifications are demanded by our customers and have become a necessary part of the way we do business. But there's very little harmonization between the numerous audits, and depending on the request of our customers, some companies are forced to hold multiple audits, which can become very time-consuming and very costly, and sometimes redundant as well. Suffice to say, our supply chain management has become critical. Food security is the umbrella under which food safety must operate. And food safety and security must be supported by everyone in the supply chain with a commitment to preventative measures that will detect and correct problems before they can occur. Knowing our growers, knowing our packers and who our distributors and retailers are, and keeping in close interaction between members of the supply chain, 
also helps to increase the effectiveness of food safety controls and reduce hazards in produce when it's in transit from one part of the chain to the next. Recalls can severely impact production, disrupt the market, and cause irreparable economic losses. And we know that once consumer confidence is damaged, it's extremely difficult to recover. The world is shrinking around us, and our food supply is expanding to become a global supply. It's a very competitive market, and the need for harmonization is an urgent one. The Global Food Safety Initiative has recognized that need. Major global retailers, industry associations, and some audit firms have united in an effort to create and adopt a set of uniform food safety standards. They acknowledge that the future of food safety depends on cooperation among the supply chain as a whole, from producer to consumer. <coughs> GFSI recognized audits have been developed and are already being demanded by buyers who desire suppliers that are fully committed to a higher level of food safety and food quality management systems. And suppliers who complete a GFSI recognized audit certification will likely hold a powerful marketing tool to attract new opportunities in the marketplace. Traceability is already a mandatory requirement for our producers at OGBG, but the diversity and size of the operations makes it difficult to harmonize and standardize traceability practices throughout the entire chain. The costs associated are significant. Implementation, processing, new hardware and new software, and staff training are tough expenses to sell as an investment, and many companies are not yet ready to adapt. Some companies are still small enough that they're still using manual record-keeping systems. Others are keeping a mix of both manual and electronic records. And technology will play a key role in taking traceability to the next level. But total supply chain traceability remains the ultimate goal for our industry as we strive to prevent threats to consumer health. A harmonized traceability system will also assist in protecting our producers in our industry from economic losses and erroneous information provided about whose products were affected or associated with a recall and whose were not. Produce Traceability Initiative is one response to standardize the produce industry's traceability practices. Its goals are to improve food safety with internal and external track and trace programs. In order for traceability to work properly, product must be able to be traced up and down the food supply chain. And at present, most companies have internal traceability systems in place. That is to say, they are able to access their own internal traceability data and processes but they lack in external traceability programs, which is the data exchange process that takes place between the trading partners as product travels through the supply chain. PTI uses the GS1 system, which is an internationally compatible numbering and barcode system for identifying items. It provides a common language of communication for trade and electronic commerce. The system involves using barcoding to encode the necessary trace information on both inbound and outbound cases. And PTI has identified seven milestones in this transition to, the, to, to whole supply chain traceability. Their goal is that all suppliers will adapt the system by the year 2012. The bottom line is this. Food safety is fundamentally changing the produce industry. Government regulations, changes in legislation, buyer food safety demands, and customer expectations have presented us with tremendous challenges in an increasing competitive, competitive global marketplace. But we recognize that our industry's continued success is dependent upon building and maintaining a strong, safe, and secure food supply chain. This is a shared responsibility that can only be met through cooperative efforts. And on behalf of OGBG, I thank you for allowing me to speak to you today and be a part of those efforts. Step by step, we can overcome the hurdles that we face if we work together, and a step forward is a step in the right direction. Thank you.
think my presentation is going to dovetail quite nicely with Stephanie's presentation. I'm going to focus in on Canada just because that's where I'm from. And in Canada, when we look at food safety laws, you have to look at the federal level, the provincial level, and the, lo the local level. because at the you know, And we've got food safety regulation occurring at all three levels, which makes it quite complicated when we start talking about harmonization. And at the federal level, we've got at the border, and Stephanie gave some examples of at the border from a US perspective. And we've got enforcement of Canada's food safety laws by the Canada Border Services Agency. We've got a number of import license requirements for dairy, for egg, for cheese, etc. You have to either have quota or there's an over quota um, tariff rate that would apply. But in addition to there being uh, food safety laws or regulations at, for at the border, there's also regulation for inside the border, so inside Canada. And there's also regulation on interprovincial trade because Canada is a federation of a, a number of provinces and territories. And when you layer on top of the at the border, inside the border, and between provinces, then you have to look inside the provinces as well because each provincial government is regulating what is occurring in that province or territory. And so I've just given a couple of examples. I would have pages and pages and pages of slides if I went through everything and all the various um, ministries that are involved and all the legislation that is involved. But in Ontario, we've got the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, which is the main body um, responsible for food safety laws in Ontario and traceability from farm to fork, inspections, complaints, the agricultural sector, the food processing sector, labeling of wine, organic labeling, etc. So we're getting into some of even the, the new age items now as well at the provincial level. And then at the local municipal level, there's also various requirements and you know such as the inspection of, of restaurants, which is another food safety area. So when you look at harmonization, you know, you really do have an, an issue as to there's a lot to harmonize. It's not just looking at one statute and a second statute in the U.S. and, oh, how can we blend these two into one? It's a much more complicated web of tasks. And when you look at food safety laws at the federal level in Canada, this isn't the entire list, but I'm just giving you some examples. Is We start off with the Food and Drug Act, which has not really been updated in 50 years. So we're really dealing with an antiquated System. We've got the Food Inspection Agency Act, we've got the Food Safety and Quality Act 2001, the Consumer Packaging and Labeling Act, the Canada Agricultural Products Act, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, the Meat Inspection Act, the Health of Animals Act, etc., etc., and the list could go, go on and on. But I do really want to focus in on the first point that we've got legislation that is, has, has been around for a while, and when I look at what we're going to be undertaking as harmonization, the U.S. may be a little bit further ahead than we are, but it's like getting on a bike and learning to ride a bike because after a while, we're both going to be heading down the road and we haven't been down on these bikes for a while. They're going to be weaving in and out as we're trying to become accustomed to being on that bike. And we're either going to bang into each other or we're going to go over to the side and fall off unless we somehow find a way to go straight down that road side by side. And I'm not, you know, most of my presentation is going to be about some of the um, complexities and obstacles that we will, um, we will, we will find. Steph Stephanie has already uh, covered the uh, food inspection Canadian Food Inspection Agency, so I won't repeat um, her great presentation. The only thing that I'd like to point out is they administer um, 13 federal statutes and 42 regulations, so it's a good thing that I didn't list everything on the first few slides. And then at the pro provincial level, I... Um, you know, I, I basically already covered the, the provinces establish and, and enforce health and safety and quality standards and related provisions for interprovincial trade as well. Provinces are resp responsible for inspecting food processing establishments to distribute their products locally. For example, provincial inspectors assist the Canadian uh, FIA in the uh, development of national and regional sampling plans. And they have increasingly more responsibility, so it really has been a push down. In 2007, early 2008, it, the food safety kind of hit the federal agenda. And we had Prime Minister Harper announcing in Canada the, the Food and Consumer Safety Action Plan. So there's a second half of this being the Consumer Safety Action Plan. And, you know, there's an announcement they were going to modernize and, and um, strengthen Canada's safety system for food, health, consumer products. And there is a report um, called the Strengthening and Modernizing Canada's Safety System for Food, Health, and Consumer Products that was issued in January uh, 2008. And then building on that, uh, we 
have the joint statement of the NAFTA Leaders Summit in April 22nd, uh, 2008, and all three leaders said, you know, one of their priorities was to improve our citizens' access to safe food and healthy consumer products in North America. We are increasing co cooperation and information sharing on the safety of food products. We are working towards strengthening our respective regulatory and inspection systems to protect consumers while maintaining the efficient flow of food and products amongst the three countries. We are working to make our food and product safety standards more compatible. We are also working to improve the con continental recall capabilities and are engaging the private sector to ensure our efforts are complementary. So this is the announcement that came out and then the marching orders went to the various governmental organizations um, such as Health Canada and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to make this happen. And before long, we actually um, had tabled legislation. But in the environment of the, the regulatory regime and this announcement, it's because of the perfect storm that had been brewing. The perfect storm included the China melamine milk scandal, so some international threats coming into our borders. Then we had BSE, the avian flu and swine flu, which, well, uh, are in food safety per se, there is the belief amongst the consumers that the, and the, the food that we eat is bringing the illnesses that we are suffering. Then we have the listeria problem in Canada with maple leaf foods. Then we had the uh, Peanut Corporation of America uh, example where some rancid peanuts were coming across the border into Canada. They actually got stopped at the Canadian border, sent back, and it was a significant period of time before they shut down the facilities in Georgia. But it was actually at the border um, and our intercooperation that um, helped bring that problem to light. These four things brought the public concern uh, in both countries and around the world to a pretty high point. And out of that came what was um, Bill C-51. And I call it the perfect storm because later on that, in the later part of this presentation, we're going to be talking about the Canada-EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement and a CBSA report, which just complicates the situation that um, what we find ourselves in for food safety and for harmonization at this time. Now, the first thing I should tell you about Bill C-51 is it was tabled in the uh, Canadian government in the House of Commons uh, a couple sessions ago. We've prorogued twice or three times since then, and what happens when uh, when we table something, tabling is good in Canada, tabling I understand is bad in the U.S. Um, tabling means that you're putting it on the dis for discussion and to go through first, second, and third reading committees and then over to the Senate. But when we prorogue, um, and if that's not going road, it is prorogue that all the bills that have been tabled fall off the order table. So they need to be re-entered and re-tabled in the next parliament. And Bill C-51 was tabled in the 39th parliament, I think it was the second session, but it hasn't been re-tabled yet. So whether or not there was sufficient outcry at that point in time, and busy beavers are, are rewriting the provisions, I, I, you know, I, I don't know, I suspect. But I'm going to be raising a number of provisions that I hope my U.S. colleagues may raise some red flags going, it's not really what Canada's thinking of doing, because this is our update to the for, uh, Food and Drug um, Act. So the in new section 2.3 of Bill C-51 has the purpose. It says the purpose of this act is to pr protect and promote the health and safety of the public and encourage accurate and consistent product representation for, by prohibiting and regulating certain activities in relation to foods, therapeutic products, and cosmetics. For the rest of this presentation, I've actually removed therapeutic products and cosmetics and I'm focusing in on food, but there is some overlap in what we call um, therapeutic products and, and what others might call foods such as vitamins. There are a number of prohibitions. If the number in the presentation is an even number, it's an update to a provision that's already in the Act. If there's a .1 or a .2 or a .3 afterwards, it is likely a new prohibition or a new provision that's been added to the Act. So we, there's been some modification to the existing uh, Section 3 for false or misleading information. No person shall knowingly provide the Minister with false or misleading information in relation to a matter under this Act or regulations, uh, including in relation to, to an application for a license, registration, or authorization. Not necessarily a bad, a bad thing, but when we look at some of the other provisions, um, there may be some concerns on part of our U.S. friends 
um, and U.S. companies who have Canadian subsidiaries that process food. Tampering. Uh, new 3.1 sub 1, no person shall tamper with food or its label or package with the intent to render the food injurious to human health or cause a reasonable apprehension in others that the food is injurious to human health. Not necessarily a bad provision to have, however when you add it up with some of the other provisions it may cause a concern for um, those that we do business with outside of, our, outside of Canada. New 3.1 sub 2, selling or importing for sale. No person shall sell or import for sale a food that was tampered with or in, order, in, in order to render it injurious to human um, health. And so if uh, an American friend has a product that unbeknownst to them, it has been tampered with and sends it into Canada, is there a possibility of prosecution under this particular provision when added up with some of the other provisions that um, are in the legislation? Threats. No person shall threaten to tamper with food in order to render it injurious to health. And hoaxes, no person shall knowingly um, give information that's false or reckless and that is, that is a hoax. And again, not that these provisions are wrong and, or, or ill-conceived, it's just how they will be used, especially in connection with some of the um, additions to Section 4. No person shall sell or import for sale, so the import for sale part of this provision is new. A food that has a poisonous or harmful substance in it or on it, is unfit for human consumption, is injurious to human health, is adulterated, or was manufactured, processed, prepared, preserved, packaged, stored, or conveyed under unsanitary conditions. So this is the first time we've got a prohibition of an import for sale, which puts a greater obligation on both the importer and the exporter of the food product um, to do some due diligence ahead of time to make sure that there aren't one of these, these problems. Right now, it, we kind of react when we find a problem. Now there is more of an upfront not that it's a bad thing, but it, it may create a problem with our relationships with our, our American friends. Same with uh, uh, Section 5.1, deception. No person shall manufacture, process, label, package, sell, import for sale, or advertise a food in a manner that is false, misleading, or deceptive or is likely to create an erroneous impression regarding its character, value, quantity, composition, merit, safety, or origin. Not necessarily a bad thing, however, when you look at the fact that our regulations are different with respect to fortification and use of vitamins in certain claims, the certain claims that are okay under U.S. law are not okay under Canadian law. Packaging is, uh, you know, there are different rules under U.S. law than there are under Canadian law. This particular provision may become a problem, not that someone's intending to do something really nefarious and bad. They can fall quite innocently into this provision because of the addition of import for sale and not undertaking the, the necessary questions ahead of time. Packaging, labeling or packaging contrary to regulations, a food that is not labeled or packaged as required by or is labeled or packaged contrary to the regulations is deemed to be labeled or packaged contrary to subsection 1. So there's a deeming provision that if there's something wrong with the labeling, we've got some funny labeling rules up in Canada, especially when you think about what goes on in Quebec, that the French and English labeling, um, also what needs to be on the label concerning the, the contents. It could very well be that a, a U.S. product can fall off site and it's now deemed to be um, deceptive under, the, under this legislation and gets caught by the import for sale rule and then the, pre, the section 4 import for sale rule. And the unsanitary conditions one um, is just a further addition to a uh, few extra words are added into the provision that um, were not there previously. And now it will read a person shall manufacture process for prepare, preserve, package, store, or convey for sale any food. Uh, no person shall do this under unsanitary conditions. Another new change um, to the legislation, so we've got some new prohibitions. We also have a new licensing requirement that is proposed in the proposed legislation that hasn't been retabled. So no person shall import a prescribed food for sale unless they are authorized by, uh, by a registration or license to do so. And I wish I could tell you what the prescribed foods are, but since the legislation hasn't passed, we don't have the reg since the legislation hasn't passed, we don't have the regulations promulgated to say what is prescribed and what is not prescribed at this point in time. Also, uh, interprovincial trade uh, without a license is, is also caught by a new provision. 
And section, new section 18.1 is the licensing provision, so the minister is able to make various regulations with respect to licensing, and again, the legislation passes first and then the regulations. So at the time this legislation um, was, was tabled, we didn't necessarily know what the minister was going to require on the application. But this would be new from a U.S. perspective, that it's not, you know, most U.S. companies don't have to be into the system in the same extent that they will after this legislation. And this is all going to a form of traceability that was discussed by Stephanie. Uh, then here's some selected information provisions that have really caught the eye of a constitutional lawyer up in Canada by the name of Sean Buckley. And so if you ever Google Sean Buckley, he has tons of stuff, not necessarily on the, the food aspects of the changes for Bill C-51. We also had the consumer safety legislation, which is Bill C-52, and Bill C-52 got retabled as Bill C-6. Now, it also fell when the last prorogation, but we expect that it will be back on. But just before it was prorogued, um, I, I provided my, the Senate testimony where I actually testified before the Senate with uh, Sean Buckley. So I provided that to you, and after that Senate testimony, and it was mainly based on what Sean was speaking about, uh, Senator Day uh, tabled some changes uh, to the proposed legislation on the consumer protection side. It hadn't gotten through the Senate, so we, I can't say that those changes were going to be integrated, but there was enough concern that there was a reaction on the part of some uh, senators. And new section 20.5 is similar to a uh, provision that was in Bill C-6. If the minister is of the opinion that a food may present a serious risk to human health, the minister may direct a person to provide the minister with information that is in the person's control that is necessary for the minister to determine whether it presents a risk. So there's a new requirement for companies to hand over information. And that the minister may also disclose that personal information to another person as he's carrying out his or her functions. And so that's a, a concern. But the one that I raised at the Senate was the minister may disclose confidential business information to a government or to, um, the, fall, to the following persons without the consent of the person um, to whose business or affairs the information relates and without notifying that person for a purpose that is related to the protection or promotion of health or safety of the public or if the government or person agrees in writing to maintain confidentiality of the information. That's an or proposition. So if there was some concern about how car caramel gets the caramel inside the caramel bar and that confidential business information is in the hands of the government, it is possible that the, the government may release that confidential business information if they feel that it is necessary and they don't have to ask for consent to re reveal that particular secret. Or if the uh, you know, secret formula of Kentucky Fried Chicken um, it becomes necessary to release that confidential business information. The minister is being given the power under the legislation to do so without asking for permission. In section um, 23 sub 4, uh, which is a new provision, the inspector who is carrying out their functions may enter or pass through or over private property without being liable for doing so and with, without, without the owner or the prop of the property having the right to object to the use of that property. And this is one of the items that Mr. Buckley had great problems with, is you could don't, if you don't get, if the government doesn't get a warrant, so if the inspectors don't get a warrant, they're not liable for not getting a warrant and um, engaging in some activity that causes some damage. And he's particularly concerned about that. And another addition, I think this is one of the last ones that I'm raising with you, is the inspector who believes on reasonable grounds that a food was imported for sale does not meet the requirements established under the Act or was imported for sale in contravention of a requirement under the Act may direct the owner or importer or the person having possession, care, or control to remove it from Canada at their expense, even if the inspector doesn't seize it. So it's a pretty wide power being given to the inspector, and he only has to believe on reasonable grounds. He doesn't actually have to have scientific proof that there's a problem. And it could very well be that an inspector will get it wrong. And when you're dealing with food, if some of the food is perishable, it can cre it create a, a problem. And an inspector may direct the owner or person having possession or care of an article to which this, the, the act applies um, to, not to move it. And so if it you know, is in their possession, it has to stay, go rotten in the factory. That may be something that an inspector may ask for. And under the new legislation, as it was drafted, um, you know, they would have to comply. So we've got that, we've got the Bill C-51, it's not back on the table. There are a number of provisions that may create a friction 
if we're going to be talking about harmonization um, of the Canadian rules and U.S. rules, even though it's moving in a more positive direction. And I don't want to suggest for one minute that I think that it's all bad. It's not necessarily all bad. It's just some of the effects, of it, and if it's used improperly, and the legislation, need, in my opinion, needs to be tweaked a little bit with the focus of international trade obligations. The other thing that we're going through in Canada that the U.S. may not be, uh, my friends from the U.S. might not be aware of, is Canada and the EU are negotiating a comprehensive economic and trade agreement called the CETA. And in a week, we're going to have the third round of negotiations. And right now, the IP chapter is getting out of the news and government procurement. We haven't really talked about food safety. But what, what is important um, for me to communicate about the negotiations is to get started in the Canada-EU CETA negotiations, the EU required that the Canadian part, part, provinces participate in the negotiations. Up to this point in time, the provinces have not been invited to the table for any of Canada's free trade agreement negotiations. And the EU is going to require harmonization of certain provincial laws, including SPS laws and TBT um, laws. So they are going to be asking the provinces to agree amongst themselves to some harmonized form of interprovincial trade laws and provincial laws and then come to the table with the, the harmonized laws so then they can negotiate what the EU would like us to have um, their laws. And they said, you know, one of the things, that one of the reasons why they're asking the Canadian provinces to be at the table is to uh, remove the interprovincial trade barriers that are a problem in Canada and it's a problem for the U.S. Uh, sellers and exporters, as well as EU sellers and exporters. It's not just, um, it, and quite frankly, interprovincial trade in Canada. So the question that I, I ask, and I don't know the answer to my question, is whether the EU goal, um, is, and any goals that they try and accomplish through this process, is intended to influence US laws. Does the EU want to be the first out of the gate? And if the EU can get Canada to harmonize with the EU first, then would it be that Canada will get the U.S. to harmonize with the e what the EU likes, as opposed to the EU having less of a bargaining power after Canada and the United States have harmonized their food safety and consumer protection laws? And so it's a question I don't know what the answer to, but um, you know, there is a possibility if the Canadian EU negotiations move forward faster than the Canada-U.S. harmonization discussions, um, that the U.S. may fall behind um, in, in where they want the, the goalpost to be. The last thing that I just want to raise, um, bring to your attention, is there was a February 22, 2010 Canada Border Services Agency report that came out. And it means more changes on the Canadian side of the border are coming for the border enforcement of food safety laws. And uh, it's called the Audit of the Administration of Permit, License, or Other Requirements for commercial goods. And uh, permits, licenses, certificates of other, uh, and, and OGD is a term used by the Canadian government for other governmental departments. So the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is an OGD. So other OGD authorizations are used as a control to protect Canadians in their environment and ensure only approved goods are imported. And the Canada Border Services Agency manages about 24 commercial import programs on behalf of the 14 uh, other government departments. And the audit concluded that the control framework for the administration of import permits and licenses with respect to commercial goods, which includes agricultural goods and food products, was partially adequate and effective. However, improvements were necessary, but there wasn't adequate communication between the departments. Um, and the improvements are needed in the application of border controls for the program areas that relied on reviews by border services officers and manual paper-based processes in the performance of measurement, monitoring, and information sharing. So they basically said, you know what, we, are, we, do, we aren't effectively doing the job at the border right now, so we have to make changes. And so when you've got a management action plan, and I've listed a number of their, their goals for this action plan, it means that there are changes coming and coming soon, and enforcement will increase at the Canadian border to a point that you know, we haven't seen before. There's going to be greater communication of policies internally, greater discussion, and getting to know one another internally within the Canadian government for this. So there are a number of completion dates, and I won't go through each of them. Suffice it to say that there, is, there are changes on the way at the Canadian border um, with respect to food safety. 
So in, in closing, I think that there are you know, a couple um, hot issues to tackle, and luckily Stephanie took the slide away from me on traceability, that I think that traceability is one of the hot, hot topics um, in terms of harmonization and in terms of our discussions with the EU and in what's happening at the board. This, everyone's working towards, um, towards traceability, just like we've, you know, since 9-11 we've had supply chain security this is the next step in, in that process. The other thing, a hot issue, is sweet and salty taxes and tax exemptions. Um, and I know this is something that is dear to uh, Mr. Crane's heart in, in a certain extent. That, you know, I think that some of our concerns with respect to food safety and health issues and obesity and child obesity are going to turn themselves into health taxes, such as sodium taxes. Um, where the sodium you know, content in foods are high, so we you know, want to reduce health care costs. Because Canadian government and U.S. government, you know, we, we're, I think we're starting to realize uh, pretty well that our health costs are spiraling out of control. How do, how do we reduce those costs? We make our people, our, our populace more healthy. How do we do that? We stop doing some of the things that are bad for us. So I, I can see there being sodium taxes so that goods with high sodium content are, are, have a special premium tax. Um, associated with them so that that will encourage manufacturers to reduce the amount of sodium so that their goods won't be subject to tax, so that there, there won't be um, a disincentive for buying their product. Also with the obesity concerns, there's sweet taxes and we've heard about soda taxes in the United States um, being floated as an idea. And for obesity concerns, we also have a big issue in Canada that I'm, I'm not necessarily getting into in this presentation, but fortified food claims. Um, we have different regulations in Canada as to the fortification of foods and um, are working through that process. But we, you know, one of the main concerns of the uh, Health Canada uh, with respect to fortified food claims on packaging is, do, you know, if we say that a candy bar, but it's got, you know, vitamin A and vitamin C and vitamin D, will people buy these poor food choices because, hey, I'm getting my vitamins. And you know what, I, I mean, I get vitamin water now because, hey, I'll, yeah, I'll drink pop that it says it's got vitamin be in it because it's good for me and supposedly um, it's supposed to de-stress me so I'll pick up that pop and drink it thinking that oh I'm making a good food choice as opposed to just drinking water. The last piece which is the, is, is the opposite of my first two um, things about adding taxes, what's very interesting about the Ontario government with harmonization, because we're harmonizing our provincial sales tax with our federal GST as of July 1, we've got an exemption from HST, from the 8% HST for prepared foods. So, that are under $4. So if I buy a burger at McDonald's and a soda, I get to save the HST. If I buy a donut at Tim Hortons and an iced cappuccino, which is full of sugar, I get a point of sale exemption. And it's, it kind of goes against the grain, but we've got some of these things. It's, it's supposed to help those who are have less money to spend on food, but it encourages bad food choices the way that it's, it's being implemented. So I thought that I'd raise this as a hot issue that um, needs to be tackled along with adding taxes um, to change people's eating habits for, so that food safety and, and uh, can become a top priority. And I'd be happy to ask, answer any questions. Uh, let me just remind you to please identify yourself uh, when you ask your question. For the sake of transfer. David? David. Uh, first of all, thank you both the speakers, both very interesting presentations. I'm grateful to the greenhouse growers for giving us better tomatoes in the wintertime. Uh, because I grew up when we got those awful plastic things in the supermarket, which I think had dye injected in them, all kinds of things, which was awful. I want to pick up, I'm glad that the city has picked up on this issue of uh, health. I was at the uh, uh, liberal Party Thinkers Conference in Montreal uh, a few weekends ago. We had a very interesting presentation by a woman from the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Montreal dealing with the uh, uh, social determinants of health. And she reported at the teaching hospital, which is uh, affiliated with the University of Montreal, they are now identifying preteens with all the symptoms of type 2 diabetes. And this is strictly related, this is directly related poor nutrition choices and related to the fact that the food processing industry and the fast food industries are really poisoning our kids in a sense and they're leading to conditions of obesity, hypertension, all of these kinds of things. 
And from a public health point of view, and from the issue of addressing health care costs, we have to address this. So this is going to be potentially a source of disagreement between Canada and the United States. If one country decides to get serious and the other doesn't, uh, how do you have harmonization then? But I wanted to ask Cindy a question, because she noted in the uh, amendments to the Food uh, and uh, Drug Act that uh, there's a prohibition to sell or import for sale uh, food products that are injurious to human health. Now, how do you, what is the test for injurious to human health? Because all the things I have described, I would argue, are injurious to human health. So can you apply that act to all those products? I mean, how is that going to work? Can and will are two separate things. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't say for sure whether or not there is a definition of injurious to human health in that legislation. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head whether or not there's an answer, but I, I agree with you that there is um, an issue there and the whole question will be whether or not there's the political will to use the legislation in that manner. I don't see us going there anytime soon. I think that the first cases will be the easy cases and injurious to human health would be the um, Peanut Corporation of America that, you know, you find some rancid peanuts and you can't import and sell the rancid peanuts in Canada. You can't get a whip, you can't sell food that has been rejected under U.S. law and so shipped up to Canada so that it would be, you know, at least it gets consumed and, and some money gets made for it. So I think the first cases would be under your basic, but, you know, David, you're absolutely right that there is the potential down the road when there is the greater will and um, the, a different perfect storm in, in Canada and the United States for using that type of legislation to force uh, food processors to uh, change the formulas of their food so that it's more healthy. Now, you mentioned taxes, but you can also use regulation that simply sets up a limit. And oh, absolutely. Yeah, and so that's probably a simple way of dealing with the problem than trying to have a complicated system of differential taxes. And so the honest truth is the reason why I added that slide this morning is Seth Godin, marketer extraordinaire out of the United States, actually had a blog post this morning where he was talking about soda taxes. And I thought, oh, I should add that in, and David would like like that addition to my my presentation. <laughs> but Seth Godin, you know, he he picks on these picks up these wonderful ideas that you don't follow. Please do. He's he's, he's amazing. Now, your folks only produce healthy foods. That's right. That's right. We produce uh, greenhouse tomatoes, long seedless English cucumbers, and sweet bell peppers for for the most part. Um, but getting things like healthy snacks into schools is something that we're involved in as well, um, trying to get our youth eating better. Um, and I know a lot of the United States is looking at putting salad bars into the schools. I think that's a fantastic uh, idea to encourage healthy eating. Hi, I'm Phil Manson. Uh, you were talking about one aspect of the regulation relating to labeling. And one of the things you see now as we have a movement to uh, have healthier eating habits is to add a whole range of health claims associated with some of the with certain products. I guess that's led to some litigation, but I'm curious to what extent do you see harmonization in the approach to how various health claims uh, associated, okay, probiotic health claims, uh, cholesterol reducing claims you know, come to mind immediately. I'm sure there's just like a raft of other ones that are associated with products. What's the legislation going to do with respect to that, if anything? What I can tell you is at the present point in time, the Canadian and U.S. legislation is divergent when it comes to what can be on the label and what claims can be made, especially with respect to the fortification of foods. And Canada has been looking at that issue for many, many years. And you know, I, I you know, recently looked at a memo that, of changes by Health Canada in their thought process on this from 1998 to the present. We still haven't done anything. So right now, we're very divergent in our views. But that being said, I, I think that um, it is easier to harmonize 
what is okay and what's not okay to put on a label than some of the other issues such as traceability and what, pro what prohibition should be um, there and what should be prosecutable and what shouldn't be prosecutable. I think the harmonization on those points are going to be harder than um, I, I think it would be relatively easy to get a, a group of scientists in a room and medical officers and, and government negotiators and come up with a list of what can be on the label and what can't be on a label. Um, but that's just the tip, of the tip of the iceberg. But that being said, we have two different opinions right now. And uh, I don't think that Canada would agree to just adopt the U.S. rules as they currently are because we do have a concern in Canada. And, I, and one, of, one of the many concerns is that the product labeling uh, by putting fortification claims in what minerals and vitamins are in certain food products give the impression that it's healthy food when it's not healthy and is not a wise food choice. So I think we will have a stumbling block there, but I, I don't think that it's a hurdle that can't be that is insurmountable. I think it can be um, dealt with. David Fong here. I think the, uh, one of the concerns in terms of uh, uh, of the regulations relates to different requirements on labeling, and and every time we create uh, differences that we this cost the uh, cost of doing business to go up, uh, and, and 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 maybe I think it will make lawyers happy. But I think for production deficiency, uh, when now we have to put the French uh, if it's going to Canada and Quebec, and then maybe we need to put Spanish, you know, if it's going down to Texas or California. Uh, I'm just thinking that do you see the day that comes where actually we would be able to use uh, RFID chips on all food items uh, and anybody who wants to have any information that they want can be now stored on the RFID chip, chip and it provides traceability uh, as it goes through uh, the processing chain. RFID means radio frequency. I yeah. the, the honest truth is I don't see us heading in that direction. I'm not with the government, I'm a law firm, but if I'm going to put my, you know, look into my crystal ball, um, as I sometimes gaze, um, I would think that we would not have RDI chips because uh, there is a large segment of the population that wouldn't be able to afford the equipment in order to be able to read the labels on the food products. And so the lobbies would be out against that, saying that it isn't fair to a large segment of society who actually should be looking at this information. So it needs to be in a readable format that is, that is, that is visible. I mean, that's my gut reaction, is that it, it's not going to happen soon and, and for that reason. Uh, but it's not that it's not, I mean, I think it's a great idea. And I think that there are, are things that can be done and we can move in a direction where there is uh, information communicated more efficiently. Um, but when we get when we cha change our labeling, we're going to put the sticker manufacturers in a, in a detrimental position because right now you, do, you know when you send a good up to Canada, you have a sticker that you put over the label that has the, the French um, and the, the different information. David, you may not know the answer to this. In Japan, when you go into a supermarket and you pick up a steak, you can find out right there which cow it came from. How do they do that? Do you know? <laughs> I, I don't know how, they, how the Japanese do it, but as an engineer, this is what we are doing for all our component parts. So instead of now, after one Christmas holidays, you come back and then you spend the first week trying to figure out what are all the different parts lying around are doing, you can now actually have RFID chips that would actually follow which processor, which uh, welder did the welding on which day. And then, in terms of uh, consumer uh, ability to read, like Walmart and other places, it's just as easy today, you can have a reader that if you want to know, you just walk over to the end of the aisle, and you stick the, the, the apple underneath that, and you can read everything that you want to read. Uh, so you can include now German, Japanese, everything under the sun that you want, you just pick you know, the poison that you want to read. And, so I, I'm just thinking that somewhere along the line, can we use technology to overcome some of these labeling differences, of traceability issues, product identity preservation issues, 
Uh, we're talking about trying to move product over to Asia uh, from North America instead of putting them on the grain elevators, mixing them all up and selling them at the lowest denominator quality, we would now allow every farmer to be able to say that I have the best red durum or pasta. And I don't want to sell it and mix it up with somebody else, low quality product, I put it into a container and I can ship it all the way to Chongqing for the miller to make the best bread that they wanted to make. Those are items that we are moving forward as a business to enhance the value of our commodities rather than going the other way around. And Dr. Fine, I think yeah, that's a great idea, and I think that legally, from a legal perspective, the legislation can be drafted. I think that it's possible, it's whether or not you can get that legislation passed. Um, Maybe just the last plug for RFID. Yep. Hong Kong Airport is probably the best in the world in getting the right suitcase onto the right plane. And that is because every baggage tag has an RFID chip in it. And when the suitcases go out down all the conveyor belts, the system will not allow a suitcase to go on the wrong belt. And that's just another example of how this technology is being used in a very simple way. We only need another half hour to fully explain this. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to be wonderful. I've been checking my bag downtown, and then I just walk onto my plane with my carry-on. So, I mean, the Hong Kong airport system, you bring it on into Pearson. I'm, I'm you know, that came about because of the chaos they had uh, when Hong Kong International Airport yeah. opened up and they were using a uh, uh, barcode and the chaos came about because the reader were covered with a, a layer of dust and, 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 and Hong Kong was, is the world's largest international air cargo airport and enormous an amount of my crabs got killed because they could not be moved because my crab can only stay alive 35 hours and so, so I think RFID, in my mind, has to come because it overcomes the sight of line issues. When you move something through a portal, you read 100,000 items immediately, and everything can now be followed because it's a, a two-way label as you move through the, the, the value chain. Other questions? Uh, Selma Lessenberg, my question is directed at Stephanie. I missed the first few minutes of your presentation, and I apologize if you covered this. But what I wanted to ask you about was, in your experience, whether you've run into the expedited um, dispute settlement processes on the Chapter 7 of the NAP, I think it's Chapter 7, where there's an expedited process to deal with quality and um, quality issues for uh, fruits and vegetables coming across the border going both ways. And if you have, what has your experience been? And secondly, do you think that's something that we should or could adopt more broadly uh, in order to move goods across our borders more effectively and more quickly? Well, it's a very good question. In my experience myself, no, I have not been um, directly involved. Um, but our organization, um, we are members of a dispute resolution uh, body. Um, I think I would encourage you to contact the board directly with your question. I can provide you with uh, the email address, and our general manager can answer that uh, much better than I could for you. I have a question, um, I guess, uh, for you. Um, if the European Union uh, harmonizes first, Canada. What does that look like? And how is that different? What are what are the significant differences between their approach to the whole array of food safety issues as, as compared to the United States? That chapter hasn't been leaked yet. The IP chapter's been leaked, um, but the uh, SPS and TBT chapters and the customs chapter has not been leaked. And, and we're, it's, it's hard to get information about the negotiations. Uh, you know, I'm constantly writing about the fact that you know we, we don't have any information, we don't know what's going on, and it's not even leaking out after a round is finished as to where the problems are. We know that the EU has a problem with Ontario's um, Green Energy Act. We know about there being prop the, the, the extensive changes in the IP chapter beyond anything I've ever seen. Um, and we know that um, 
the EU and uh, the Canadian government actually have accused Ontario of foot dragging with respect to tabling their government procurement concessions. So that's what's leaked out so far, but we don't have anything on food safety as uh, you know leaking out. But I, you know, I raised those discussions because if Canada moves forward in those discussions and an agreement is reached, it may be that um, the U.S. is going to sign on to the EU-Canada program as opposed to it being a Canada-U.S. Uh, development plan that then gets handed over to the Europeans. So uh, maybe we have an issue that we need to work on together and work on more quickly than we thought because of the Canada-EU discussions. Any other questions? Yes. When I was doing another job where we moved uh, smelter sulfuric acid from northern Ontario into the United States, uh, one of the elements that we came across are the mining, the abandoned mining shafts after the, uh, the, uh, the, the mineral has been taken up. So there was a suggestion one time that we should actually have our greenhouse in the mining shafts uh, because this is secure, uh, you can control the humidity, you control the lighting, and, you, and it is free uh, to that extent. Uh, and, and, and when one of my the CEO said, well, why don't we grow roses down there? If you can grow tomatoes and everything else, why are we still importing roses from Colombia? Why can't we grow our own roses? That's a very good question. Um, you saw in our production schedule that I had up earlier that we're actually um, out of production in tomatoes and peppers in the months from December to February. Uh, and that's when the bulk of importation occurs. Um, but we are working on um, strategies to, uh, to grow year-round. Uh, it's very difficult uh, where we're from. Um, if there isn't enough light, uh, the heating costs of the greenhouses, energy costs are a concern. Um, for a lot of growers, it's just not cost effective to grow all winter long yet. Uh, but there's new technologies coming out all the time uh, that are helping with that. And here's my off the record comment, so don't take this answer. Is how do you think the cocaine's going to get into Canada if we aren't if we don't have them with the roses throwing off the dogs coming into <laughs> Colombia? Well, actually, I think the mine shafts are best for growing marijuana because <laughs> you can control humidity much better there. But that's exactly why we discuss as engineers we should grow tomatoes and so forth in the mine shafts in Canada because of the winter. The mine shafts are so well insulated; you have no heating costs. So I would appeal to you, your association, to reconsider abandoning your greenhouses and go down to the mine shafts, especially for the winter. I'll definitely take that suggestion back to the board. Thank you. It's a long way from leaving to the Kirkland Lake. Exactly. <laughs> so they can double their production. They can produce in Leamington and in Kirkland Lake. <laughs> well, I'm delighted with the West Lake Ohio. Adding to the gentleman's comment, there it is of use for an abandoned mine in southern Summit County, which is where Akron, Ohio is. And what they're doing with it is compressing the air, so turning it into a massive air compression chamber, and then using it to drive turbines at night, so it generates electricity at night. Um, and they're going to reverse it at some point to generate electricity by day. So that's well underway. I don't know if they could grow food inside it, well, at the same time, uh, but there is a use for these abandoned lines. Thank you. I think this will be the last question. Are you taking Henry's role and asking a question to each panel? Oh, for sure. Okay, just check that. <laughs> I don't have the bell. Well, we could. We've got the bell. We've got the bell if you want to borrow it. Oh, this is just a small comment. It will, will, will be very short. Uh, it's Michael Robson. The um, report that we had, and I think, I think you missed that meeting, um, to uh, an OBA uh, international section uh, meeting from the chief negotiator for Canada on the EU thing, um, made me think that I would not bet on this happening at all. And as he said, uh, very cogently, I think, 
the one thing we've absolutely for sure agreed upon is go big or go home and do it fast. So unless we can get this done and cover all the bases, including, Jimmy Maxwell will be pleased to know, getting rid of supply management, uh, this yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. it isn't going to happen. And, and I would say the odds are rough, yes, 50-50 at best. Um, I think we're scheduled for a short break now. Um, so, and I don't know, is there anything out there to eat? Uh, if so, vote empathy. <laughs>